this morning I'm continuing on with the series that John set out for us for both Sunday mornings and also for the, uh, the Practicing the Way course that he's been talking about, and that's Practicing the Way by John Mark Coma. And today we're going to be starting part two of the uh, practices that he gives us. The first was being with Jesus. And today we start on the subject of becoming like him. Um, and so I'm hoping that I'm not going to keep you guys for too long. Um, I'm kind of a, I'm not used to preaching focused around a book. So I find myself throwing in a lot of things from the book, from myself, from other factors, and hopefully it all uh, forms a cohesive thought that makes sense. Um, <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll go straight into it. So first of all, we need to address an elephant in the room. And that is that we are all going to die. We're all heading in that same direction. No matter what we do, we can't stop it. We are alive right now, and one day we are going to die. But we are not there yet. That's good, right? So what are we doing now? Because if we are all facing the same inevitable, then surely what we do now matters. Are we making the most of it? Because what we do now matters, and only we ourselves get to decide how we fill this time of life, these precious days that are given to us. A wise man once said, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. You're welcome. I know you guys come to expect a Lord of the Rings reference in my sermon, so there it is. So we have a precious small amount of time before we face the inevitable grave. What are we doing with that time? Because no matter what we do, we are being formed, we are growing, we are shaping. But what are we forming into? And it's important that we remind ourselves that yes, we are going to die. Remind ourselves of this daily. Not because we want to become obsessed with morbidity. Not because we want to live in fear. By all means, like, do not get that message, be afraid you're going to die. That is not what we want to focus on. Instead, remember you're going to die so that it can influence you in your life now to make it matter, to make it count. Comer talks about um, having a uh, living with either resume or CV virtue or a eulogy virtue. So if we are living for our CVs, we are living to make what matters our work, our financial success, our hobbies, our skills, our businesses. But if we are living for our eulogy, we're living for our character, to be remembered by the way we treat other people, to be remembered by our kindness, our love. And it's something that I've always struggled with, with personally, because I think I've never had the CV virtue in my mind. And even growing up, like trying to pick out the course for my future, I found myself actually really darkly, suicidally even depressed because I did not want my life to be defined by my job. And it wasn't until I discovered the mission field that it suddenly came together for me and I realized actually my job can be something that makes a difference in the world and not just finances and surviving. And now that I'm unemployed because of health reasons, it's, e it's even more uh, of a burden that, you know, we, we tend to make in society. We make our lives all about what we do, how we work, what our work is, what our degrees are. And it's, I've always found it so sad, and I find it sad now, and that it tends to be whenever we meet new people, one, we ask their name, two, we ask what their job is. Those are the first two things you learn about a person. And that's not how I want to be remembered. That's not what I want people to know about me. I don't want people to focus on my career. I want people to focus on my love for other people. Because we are not our jobs. We are so much more. And I personally want to be remembered for love, not for my nine to five. So going back to it, we are all doing something. We're all being shaped by something. Rather, what we're doing is productive to the cause, or rather, it's distracting ourselves from the inevitable. We are all being formed by our genetics, family, society, 
what we consume. I'm having to distract myself and keep my screen from locking. <laughs> but we are all being shaped into something. And now I'm going to take a little a step away from theology. I'm going to do something a bit bold here. I'm going to switch off the theology switch and turn on psychology. Does anybody here like psychology? I, I've always found it fascinating. I'm not an expert. I got a minor degree in it, but the minor degree was an associate's degree from community college. And if that means nothing to you, that's fine, because it really does mean nothing. <laughs> it's just a hobby. More, more than anything, it's just something I'm fascinated by. I'm not an expert, so I'm going to keep it short. But I want to, this morning, have a quick look into the human psyche as described or understood by Sigmund Freud. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Maybe. There we go. Who's heard of Sigmund Freud? Yes, everyone? Right, so I promise I'm not going to talk about the... Uh, parent-child relationships, that, that those ideas. What we're going to look on is his idea of the human psyche, the human consciousness, and what shapes the decisions that we make. So who here has heard of the ego, right? So everyone's heard of an ego whenever people talk about someone that's really proud and arrogant and thinks too much of themselves. We say that they've got an inflated ego. So in short, the ego is the self. It's the conscious decisions that we make that shape us into who we are. It is our personality, our character. Who's heard of the id and the superego? A few hands, but not, not as many. Everyone knows about the ego, but the id and the superego are a bit further out there. So the id is sort of our natural animalistic instinct. It's the subconscious drive to get what we need and to take what we want. Now, all humans are born with this id. As a baby, you live to survive. You live to get what you need. But then we grow up and we start to form a conscience and we become more. The superego is what Freud considered sort of our moral drive. It's internalized values often shaped by society that shape us into who we want to be and what we want to do, how we want to make our lives. And so the ego is the expression of what path we choose in taking more of the id or taking more of the superego. What comes out is the ego itself. And so we have to battle between these two things, our natural drive to get what we want or to become better. So click, click. We're uh, back to uh, theology again. Um, that works. So it, um, it kind of takes me into this illustration that I've done in the past. I don't know if all of you that were here, whenever I did this earlier this year or last year, I made an illustration with a ramp. And I'm not actually going to use a physical illustration this time. But as you can see here, this is our life right up here. We start up here. We're born. And then we live. We roll down this hill. And eventually we die. And I didn't make it a hard stop because we're Christians and we believe that there's more to life than death. But we live and we roll down this ramp. We're heading to the grave. It's natural because I'm not a scientist. Maybe John over here can confirm gravity. It's a force of nature, right? It's what happens. It's natural. It's inevitable even. That's what happens. Gravity leads us down. So life leaves us, leads us to death. And so we roll down, can't stop it, it's what's happening. Fun. So we are born, we live, we die. The id teaches us to survive. It wants us to survive as long as we possibly can. It extends that line as far as it can. We are born, and bear with me, hang on, don't get out your stones yet. We are born to serve the self. To look after the self above all else. And this is good if you are an animal and your goal, sole purpose is survival. But we are humans. There is more to us than survival. There is more to us than just being an animal that relies on instinct. And now we could get into the philosophy of this, what it means to be a human. We could spend hours discussing it because 
there's just so much context in the question of what it means to be a human. Did you know that we survive longer in community than those who live in isolation? Humans need community to live healthily. And to live in community takes a sacrifice of that instinctual id need for survival. We can't just take what we want in community. We have to do more. So to be a human is to be more than just an animal, to be more than just a survivor. And here today, we believe in God. Most of us I think are Christians. And so we believe even more. We are not just humans. We are born in this world. And then God's life is breathed into us. We bear the image of God. And that is such a big responsibility. We are not just surviving. We are bearing God's image. And so suddenly, our responsibility in this line becomes so much greater. And I think that Jesus, he is like a super, super ego. He is the one that shapes us and encourages us and inspires us to be so much more than just the survivor. So because Jesus, as I said earlier, whenever I did this in the past, I pointed out Jesus didn't live a life that just rolled down by gravity. Jesus was beyond the forces of gravity. He rolled into the grave and he defeated death and he lived a life that went upwards. He rolled into life, not into death, and he invites us to do the same. But to do this takes sacrifice. It takes lifting our eyes up off of the grave, off of the inevitable, and looking into something greater than just our survival instinct. Jesus did this by leaving behind that instinct to survive. Jesus did not live for the self. Jesus did not live to get what he needed, to get what he wanted. Jesus lived to sacrifice, to show others love, to show others mercy, to be gracious, to give what he had for the great of others. Jesus did not serve the self. Jesus served the interest of heaven. And that interest is love. And I think that this is... It shapes the garden story, you know, the story of the fall. I think that once upon a time, we didn't live on an incline like this or a decline. Instead, life was straight. It was a level field. And we were able to exist in oneness with love and oneness with life. And we weren't rolling into the grave. We were living life. But one day we looked in on ourselves and we found something far more beautiful than anything we saw before we fell in love with ourselves and we stopped looking up. We stopped looking outward, started lo looking inward. And so now we're separated from God, not because God's angry at us, not because God's ashamed of us. Oh, I forgot where I was. Okay. Not, not because God's ashamed of us, but because we are too distracted with ourselves. But our job as humans who recognize the calling from God is to look up. It's that simple, that difficult, to look up and allow God to transform us, allow Jesus to transform us by taking our eyes off ourself. He will transform us. And it always comes back to this word, this one ultimate word, which is love. Because we can't be transformed on our own. We can't make this change in our own strength. We must rely on the one who is love, the one who dwells in love, who um, I think John's used this term before, the one who is love loving. And so we can this morning hopefully challenge ourselves, look inward, am I becoming more loving? Am I keeping my eyes off myself? Am I becoming more loving, more kind, more gracious, more forgiving? Or am I staying the same? Am I still serving the self? Am I becoming more loving to my enemies? Because this is a really hard challenge. A really hard challenge. Because love isn't just about affection towards other people. It's about sacrifice. The agape love, 
true godly love. It looks to the good of others. It looks to the interests of others above its own self-preservation. It lays down its wants, its desires, its needs for something greater. It prays for its enemies and blesses those who persecute it. And this is something I'm really struggling with, and I'm going to be a bit open with you guys, and I'm sorry if I cry. I'm going to have a little sin confession. Because I... <laughs> so I, I think I've shared my testimony before about the importance of forgiveness. And forgiveness, I think, is one of the most important things we could ever learn to do. And it's a great challenge. Um, I, I think now is not the time to get into the concept of forgiveness, but we can talk later. I think that forgiveness, we often misrepresent what it means. It doesn't mean to condone abuse. It means to let go of a debt that you are owed. So you want payback and then you let it go because you're no longer waiting for a payback. And it is freeing and it is transformative. And I once learned how to forgive those who had hurt me in the past. It was the most transforming thing of my life. And it was difficult, but I did it with God. And he completely changed everything about my life. And it was difficult, but I did it. And that was fine. But the question I'm asking myself these days is how do you love somebody that's currently hurting you? That is difficult. And I won't go into too many details about this, but most of you know a little bit about me. You know that I'm American. And you know that I was just in America visiting family a few weeks ago. Um, I had put it off for years because, once again, not to get into the grave details, there's some things that are happening in America that is a bit extreme. There's a lot of anger and there's a lot of hatred. And that anger and that hatred has become very common, very mainstream. And I found that anger, hatred, and violence to be, cons it's consumed most everyone I know back home. And I think that there was a certain time where I found myself having to distance myself from Facebook and everything because I found the very words that my own family were speaking were violence against me. Even my own mother shared a post about how people with my ideology should be executed. How do you love through that? They made me their enemy. I don't want to be their enemy, but they made me their enemy. How do you love through that? Because this is real, you know? It's easy to say love your enemies, but it's difficult to actually do it. I don't know how. I got through those uh, two weeks because of the support and encouragement of my husband and because of God. And it's only through God can we love those who hate us. And I think this is what Jesus was taught. I've gone backwards. There you go. I think this is what Jesus was talking about when he talked about being born again. And it's one of my pet peeves. You'll hear, I, I've got so many pet peeves. <laughs> but one of my pet peeves in church is the way that we've watered down the concept of being born again. Because being born again isn't just this saying the sinner's prayer, having your baptism and communion, going to church on Sunday and saying the Lord's prayer. Being born again. So much more than that. Jesus talks about it in John chapter 3. He's talking with the um, religious leader, the Pharisee, Nicodemus. And he explains how, yes, we were once born in the flesh, just as my chart up there showed. We were born, we we're living, and as we live, we are forming, growing, shaping, and then we will die. But we must also be born in the spirit. It's not just enough that we are born in the flesh. We must also be born in the spirit. And in this spirit, we will grow, we will form, we will shape into love and life. We will not be shaped into death. We will be shaped into life as we are born in the spirit. And Jesus says that it is something that he brings to us. It's something that we cannot do alone. 
He says it's because of him and through him, because and by his love for us, can we be born again. So it's not about the sinner's prayer. It's about a transformative journey that shapes us into who we are, from self-serving creatures of the flesh into creatures of love. And we cannot do this on our own. In another scripture, Jesus is addressing an impossible task he's given us. And he says, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And I find myself these days very relieved that I don't have to do it on my own. That I don't have to find the strength to love. I just have to look upwards and let him love through me because he is there for me. He is there for you. He is there for us. So to make it a little bit lighter and go back to the book. So we need to stress, yes, God is forming us, but we don't get there by accident. We don't just wake up one day to find that I am a new creature of love. It takes a certain responsibility from us. And Comer talks about this, uh, this three-point model that we find ourselves falling in in church. And many churches just stay in this and never push past it. And that is, they go to church, pray and read the Bible, they give, rinse and repeat. And that is what Christianity is to them. And these are all good things. And we should be doing all of these things. They're very good, very helpful. But they are not what transform us. They are not the full picture of following Christ. He also brings up this critical journey chart, which is by Janet O. Hagberg and Robert A. Gulick. <laughs> um, so in this, they explain this journey that we take as Christians, that you know, we begin by finding God. We're very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. We're excited to learn about God. We're, dis we're excited to discover his love. We're excited to know him. And then as we continue on this journey, we're excited to serve. We're excited to go to church, to be his community. We're excited to do all of these things. And we're full of emotion and everything's bright and happy. And it's amazing. But then we begin to look inward and start to dissect the things that need to be shaped and transformed. And we hit a wall because all of the emotion starts to fade. We get into a normal rhythm of things. All of the illusions and expectations that we've built up for this Christian life, they start to fade, and we're just left with real life, and we grow weary, and we give up. We turn around and fall into that shallow three model, um, but three point model again. We're all, we're all going to hit this wall. It's natural because we can't ride on the high of emotion forever. Emotions fade, they're a good and useful tool. But we need more for a true, mature faith. And it's a growing pain that we must push past. It's uncomfortable. But we must decide, not with emotion, but, be, but with determination, to push past this wall. Because if we don't, we fall into this... This is a shallow three-point model that we talked about. And it's a life of hypocrisy. And it's not even that we're necessarily trying to be hypocrites. It's not that we're trying to live as you know, fake Christians or whatever you want to call it. But it's just something that happens whenever we don't seek God and just start getting into the rhythm of seeking ourselves but with a religious flair. You know, uh, the first letter of John talks about this, how a... There are all of these people, even then, 2,000 years ago, that said that they, they loved Jesus, that said that they followed Jesus, but they weren't loving their brothers. And he, he was really harsh. He said, they're liars, and the truth isn't in them. I don't want to be like that. It's a hard hitter. And I'm not saying any of this to weigh anyone down or condemn anyone. I'm not accusing anyone of that, by the way. I, I just hope that we can find encouragement in it instead, find a challenge. Because the thing is, 
we all like to talk about the dwindling church numbers, how everyone's walking away from the church. But I've met so many people and read about so many people that are leaving the church in search of love, in search of peacefulness, and in search of mercy, acceptance, because they're looking at the church and they're not finding it here. Not, not necessarily this church, no, the church internationally. They're not finding love in the church, so they're looking elsewhere. They're not finding peace or mercy or love. And I think that's sad. I don't know about you guys, because when I think of Jesus, I think of one who is loving, peaceful, and merciful. But people aren't finding that in the house of God. So they're looking elsewhere into other religions and philosophies, namely Buddhism. And I just, I think that it's sad that they have to look somewhere else. And I think that we can be that change, that we, we, we can be the church that people can find this in, that they don't have to go elsewhere to find love, that they don't have to go somewhere else to find mercy, that we can be that change. So I hope that this morning, um, Pete will lead us in a final worship song in just a minute as I, uh, after I close us off with a prayer. Hopefully we could just take some time to look inward this morning and just ask ourselves that question. Am I becoming more loving? Am I becoming more gracious? Am I becoming more forgiving? Am I looking up? Am I looking to Jesus? Because I think that we can be that together. We can be the church that people find love in. We can be people that are transformed by love. So, yeah, I'm always bad at wrapping up. So I'll just say a little prayer and the worship band can finish, <laughs> finish it off. And then we'll have teas and coffees and everything. Um, we can pray if you need to pray. So, Jesus, we thank you that your love is enough that you are the one that transforms and shapes us, that you are the one that invites us to be born again in the spirit and to be transformed in our spirits into people of love. We thank you that it truly is the best way to let go of the self, to let go of our egos, and to trust in you. And we recognize it takes trust to love you. It takes trust to love like you. But God, that's what we want to be, and that's where we want to be. So Lord, this morning we ask that you give us the strength and the conviction to address these parts of our hearts that are self-serving and to lift our eyes up to you and to truly become like you. Amen. <laughs>